and a lovely good afternoon. Shall we pray? Father, we say that we are so grateful and so much blessed by your goodness. For it is the goodness of the Lord that leads a person to change their mind about you. We say we are so grateful to you and we rejoice in all that you've done for us and are doing for us. Father, we commit today's teaching to your hands that the name of the Lord Jesus shall be glorified through the explanations. I pray that, Father, the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we shall be strengthened with might by your spirit in our inner personalities. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that Christ who dwells in our heart by faith will be more rooted or more clearer, made more clearer in our understanding so that we are, we are fixed, we are certain about all that he has done. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that through this word, oh God, it will cause us and our love to abound yet more and more in accuracy of knowledge and that we shall be aglow with your spirit, that Father, that we shall walk securely in you. If there is anything that we seem to stand in the way of our understanding, Father, I bring it down in the name of Jesus. I paralyze it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's in the form of slowness to understand, dullness of perception, indifference, bigotry, pride, unpersuadableness, traditions of men and women that are, does not conform to the finished work of Christ, or it's our own private personal interpretations away from the finished work of Christ. Father, I completely paralyze those activities of Satan, and we allow only the word of the living God to stand tall in our understanding today. I thank you for utterance. I thank you that you care for us. And I commit that all those that will be here, that they will have a listening ear and a listening heart to the praise of your name. I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen and amen. Hey, good afternoon, Sister Hetty. Glory. Amen. Hey, yes, Reverend. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Kadada, kadada, kadada. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, I, I like, I like, I like, I like, I like that. I like that hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We are doing Fantastic. well. Thank you and yourself. Oh, favored for life because of Christ. Amen. Because of Christ. Amen. 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 And here comes also Sister Nina. Good afternoon, Sister Nina. Bless you. I hope you are good as well, Sister Nina. Okay, maybe she's in a place she cannot, she cannot talk. Okay, all right, okay, 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 that's good. All right, so now let us get into the study. Well, welcome to our teaching devotional FGCI London branch, all the way from the east of London, our daily teaching devotional, Epic Gnosis Daily Believers Bible Study Fellowship with myself, Reverend Fred Abekan. And I say thank you also for the leaders that are here and all those that will join in the course of the teaching. Now, so far, all the teaching has been so technical. You know, why? Because in teaching, God is trying to communicate a sense of position. So it's not just a case of just reading. The idea is to catch the flavor of the writer, is to capture the very flavor of the writer. That is the essence of Bible study. It's not just reading for reading's sake. No, 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 Rebecca. The aim is to capture, sit at the place where the writer sat. Be in that frame of mind of the writer as the writer. It is like you yourself, you, you, are, you are transported to the time the person was writing. You can see the entire way the person is thinking, the thinking process that is going on in the person's mind. That is how you do it. So you put yourself in that person's shoe based on what was going on around that time. So that is why this teaching is very important. And for me, it's important to me because for so many years, I have been robbed, badly taught, 
in this area of the Bible study we are doing. May I say a very big welcome also to Chioma all the way from Ghana. I salute you, my dear sister. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So now let's get into our Bible study and get into the, new, the word of study and continue from where we left off as it were yesterday. So once again, I would advise pay attention. These are topics that, you know, for me, even though I am teaching it, I am learning. I'm not only just teaching it. I'm not just offloading it. As I am teaching, me too, I am learning. If it is good for you guys, <laughs> it's good for me. <laughs> because it is the word of God. It should benefit every, everybody. So it's not, I'm teaching them. I'm, no, 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 no. As I am teaching me myself, I am teaching myself. Because it is a very critical subject. The church has been denied and lied to for far too long. It's time for the tables to turn. So we are dealing with spiritual growth in Christ Jesus, what it is and what it is not. Lesson 105, season number one. So this whole series that we've been doing since January, this whole series that we've been doing since January, it's just the foundation of spiritual growth. Once that is established, then next year we are going, it's going to be brutal. We're going to deal with more things. Welcome, my dear sister, Lady Perpetual Afari. I salute you. Thank you for being here. Thank Hello, you. Hello, Pastor. Hey, <laughs> Lady P. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? And how I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well, Excellent. thank you. you? Oh, favored for life in Christ. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Good to, good to have you always around. Bless you too. Bless you too. Thank Bless you. you. Excellent. You've not missed anything. We just, we're just taxing. So now we're about to take off. <laughs> Amen. Right on time. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. All right. So let us look at spiritual growth now. So once again, when you see the word spiritual growth years ago, I thought that it meant that my spirit inside me is growing by stature and size. <laughs> but that is not what it means. So if you flip the word around and you call it growth spiritual, what it means that growing in the understanding of what the spirit of Christ has made available. And there, there is nowhere in the Bible for us to know where our, our understanding of the things that Christ has given us can be found except in the books from Romans to the book or the letter that Paul wrote to a guy called Jude. That is our family album. Those places, they are our magna charta. If you sleep there, now we are not saying that do not read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -mm. We are not saying that don't read Genesis to Malachi. But if you read Genesis to Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John first, before you come to this, you'll be confused in the Bible. So start with the epistles. Eat the epistles. Then work your way backwards. That way you understand. Because the epistles, Jude, the books of Romans to Jude, they are the explanation of the entire Old Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I always repeat this because I see how believers are struggling and I'm showing you that this is the way out. Okay? So spiritual good is... That means having an understanding of the epistles, excellent. How they fit each other. Where, what, what, what stays here, what stays here. When you see something here, it looks like it's contradicting, but it's not contradicting. You know why Paul said this here. You know why Peter said this here. And how they, they all synchronize. They are in sync with one another. All right. So let's go. So spiritual growth, therefore, refers to growing in the clear understanding of the epistles. And we said that one area the believer needs to grow in accurate, look at how I'm emphasizing that way, accurate understanding is concerning our authority in Christ. Oh boy, when I talk about that, I just sometimes get even emotional there because for years I was robbed in this area. For years, since I received Jesus in 1981, I had nobody, I had nobody teach on this topic. Nobody. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. I said nobody. The only, only person that I came across first to teach about this was the late Dr. Kenneth Hagin, 
of the of the renowned Rima Bible College in Tulsa, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. He was the first in his book, The Believer's Authority. Then I listened to the video later on. That book and that thing, ah, uh, I learned it like my life depended on it because nobody was teaching it. Nobody, nobody was teaching it. Then after that, I began to grow in it and understand. Even that, it was hit and miss, hit and miss. Very, very important. Very, very important. So it's an area that believers are not well. So it has been taught wrongly. It has been taught wrongly. So we said that for the believer, it is not Satan and demons per se that we are fighting directly, but their abilities. We've said that already. Then we said that the believer's authority that we have in Christ is our nature. So that means that it is the spirit of God that qualifies the believer to have that inherent authority. It's not an authority that is borrowed. It's not an authority that you need to do something to get it first. No, the moment you are born again, you have the entire hegemony of the power and authority of God. Because the spirit of God in you is the power of God. That's why he said in Acts chapter one, verse eight, for you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So the believer is a walking powerhouse. We've talked about that. Then we also said that Jesus is God in human form for the purpose of salvation. But even though he was God almighty in human form, he prayed always. Why? Because prayer, we said, is the control room. Is the control room. Jesus did not need anything. Never lacked anything. So we said that God is made strong in the believer when the believer exercises their authority. God is made strong through the believer. So when we say that God is strong, it is to the degree that the believer exercises the authority. So we don't mean that if you don't exercise your authority, God cannot help you. But he cannot help you as far as he wants. Take note of that critically. Critically. As far or as how he designed the system. Very important. Very, very important. Now we said there is nowhere from the book of Romans. Let me start with the book of Acts. From the book of Acts to the book of Revelation where a letter was written to any group of believers by Paul, by Peter, by James, by John, the writer of Hebrews, to say that when you are in trouble, problem, you must pray to God for God to come and let him come and do something about it. Or if God really wants me to, he will do it. God, do it all, do it all, do it all. Nothing like that. Why? Because we have been given the authority. We have been given the authority. Absolutely important and critical. So we said that the authority is already the day we got born again. And we said there are two ways that authority is expressed. It is expressed, number one, through words of declarations of Bible verses. So here I am, I am praying, Rasuka, Madeya, Ekoto, Mededede, Kadadada, Kozokoyo. Then I do what? I release Bible verses. See, I release Bible verses. I release Bible verses. Then the other way is that I speak in tongues, Libra, Kakaye, Edebose, Kataya, according to James chapter 5, verse 16, the effectual, fervent prayer, continued, sustained in speaking in tongues, generates power. So anytime you speak in tongues, you have generated, you know, you have generated cosmic power. It is on your lips. In that power now, you can begin to command and arrange things the way you want. You know, when you understand commanding power, it's, it's fun. It's fun to do that. So that's why we call it the control room. Command what you want. That's why he has given it to you. Command what you want. Then we said in the commanding, we are not, we can command, we are dealing with Satan's abilities, schemes, tricks, strategies, deceptions, lies, 
maneuvers, network, not him. We explain clearly that even in Jesus resurrecting from the dead, he did not destroy Satan in the sense that he ceases to exist. No, it was some ability he was holding that he destroyed. Spirits will are spirit, they don't die until they are perished in the lake of fire, not Lake Geneva or Lake Tahu. Very, very important that we understand that. Okay. So it is when you generate that power. So the authority is used on, on spirits, their abilities, you restrict their movement on things, on circumstances, on situation. You cannot use the authority over human will. No. To do that is witchcraft. But we can pray, knowing what we know now, we can pray so much that because most people's, most people's thinking are as a result of influences, biases, prejudice, bigotry, you know, influences. So we can dismantle the influences of that man, that woman, that is not allowing them to see or to do. See that now? So a manager is there, you know, for some reason, he has got something inherent that you can't see against white people, black people, yellow people. So that has become a bias. And he filters all his decisions or her decisions through the prism of that bias. So if I'm, I know what I know now, I don't physically attack him. No, there is a mindset which has become a stronghold that does not allow him to see you the way he's supposed to see you and relate to you. So I dismantle the influence of that mindset that allows you to think like that. See that now? See that now? So that's what we are dealing with. Very, very important. So we said that the, 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 the believer's control room, authority, commanding power is generated in the time of prayer. So that means that prayer, therefore, now is no longer an attitude of being laid back. It is everything. When you understand this, prayer becomes a joy. So all I do is I generate power. When I generate the power, now the things I want, the things I want, the things I want, I begin to rearrange them according to myself. And it's, 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 it's fun to do that. So one area we dealt with yesterday to know that the believer's authority is not some borrowed authority. It's not, it's not something that you know I do once in a while. So it should be incorporated. It should be part and parcel of your consistent daily life. So whether you worship and you praise and all that. Now let me correct something. Let me correct something. I just heard something right now. Let me correct that right now. A lot of believers think that when they are having their prayer time, when they are worshiping, they say that they are worshiping. I was, I was chatting with the Christian sister. And I said, so how's your prayer life going? What do you normally do? She said, oh, you know, when I wake up and I start first to, uh, I start to first to worship and praise God to invite the Holy Spirit. I said, huh? I said, how? I said, yeah, you see, you have to invite the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I said, oh, did you not read John chapter 14 very well? For he, the Spirit, shall abide in you forever. She said, um, okay, so what does that mean? Well, what does the word abide mean? It comes from the English word abode. What does the word abode mean? It means to dwell. What does it dwell mean? It means to reside. Do you visit where you reside? She said, no. I said, well, then exactly. So for you to say that you are praying and worshiping to invite the Holy Spirit, there is no Bible basis for that. The Spirit lives in you, tabernacles in you. There is no visiting. There is no coming. Yeah, Baya. You know, so there are some songs that are not biblical. They sound lovely. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. He lives in you. Where is he coming from? Where is he coming from? Where? Old Testament people can pray like that. See that now? But the man lives in you. First Corinthians 3.16. What? Know ye not, Kebokataya, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whose you are. Huh? 
And then also in the same also in Second Corinthians chapter six, he said that he said, "For I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them, and I shall be their God, and they shall be my people." He lives inside you. Where is he coming from? Where? Where is he coming from? Where is he coming from? So the moment you have all these wrong concepts in your mind, so you know you worship, so you are bringing the Holy Spirit. Be very careful that you don't cut some wrong things. Oh. He lives in you. So it is in that place of, you know, prayer that you should add your command. So after you pray, make commanding part of your prayer time, not only when we are in prayer meeting. So every day you need to command some stuff. Every day you need to stop some stuff. Every day, Kibaya, you need to. I said every day you need to command, rearrange, and stop things. Not them things. Not them, their maneuvers. Not them, their influences. Not out of fear, but out of confidence. Kebaka, do you understand that? So I said one area that the believer needs to grow in accurate understanding concern authority in Christ is what we are dealing with. It's an area we need to get clear understanding. So yesterday we said that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23, Paul gives us a par excellent comprehensive explanation of the inherent power that is always available to every believer since we receive of the spirit of Christ at salvation. This is what is referred to us in that verse, Ephesians 1, that God will grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This, this knowledge of this power, authority that we have is what Paul referred to as the spirit of wisdom, which is revelation. Why? Because before Jesus came, men did not know that they can have access to God's power. It was only on a few kings, prophets, and priests under the Old Testament. And even with them, the, 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 the power will come on them for a short time to accomplish a task. Once that task is finished, the spirit is off. Glory to God. But I've got good news for you. You and I, the spirit is in us eternally forever. That means the power is there eternally. The authority is there eternally. Why? He called it spirit of wisdom. Why? Because that knowledge to apply is not available in people's understanding. So it needs to be revealed in that accurate knowledge. The spirit of wisdom, which is revelation in the accurate knowledge of Christ concerning this area. So the spirit of God wants you to know that, that beyond every shadow of doubt and to know this Consciously. Now, that is a word that you need to keep somewhere in your mind. That is what I'm going to deal with today when we come to the Ephesians chapter 6. Consciously is the problem. Consciously is the problem. That, that, that's what I want, I want you to feast your eyes and your mind on. Consciously. Because not a lot of believers are conscious of that. Because they don't walk in this all the time. When problem comes, calamity strikes, they quickly forget who they are. Quickly. I mean, in a flash of a pan, who they are is escape their mind. So this authority, it is not a feeling. I've seen a lot of believers make that mistake. When they are praying, they want to feel something. So they say that the prayer was answered because they were sweating, because they felt goosebumps. No, 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 no. Your, your, your electrical circuit at home, the power is flowing always. Is it because you don't feel powerish that the electrical circuit will not work? It's independent of your feelings now. So it's not, it's not, it's not feeling. Ah, today I feel that the power, I feel the you no, know, today when I was praying, I don't think I felt the power. I've made that mistake countless number of times, and God has reminded me that it's not dependent on what you feel, it is a nature. Be conscious of that. Be conscious of that. Sometimes you might need to. Raise your voice in the name of Jesus. It will work. Sometimes too, in the name of Jesus, it will work. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a feeling. It is no, a knowing. So we have the inherent authority manifested in various, we, yesterday we look at all those Greek words of the various, what are called commanding power form. So I'll go through it quickly. From Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. 
We looked at the word surpassing greatness. The Greek word is hupabalo. We looked at the word his power. With the Greek word is megatos, which means the extent of something or what it can be measured against. So we said that God could not measure his power in you, his power in me, with anything of creation, mountains, moon, stars, the only thing in that verse that he compared the believer's commanding power authority with is his resurrection. <laughs> so that means we, 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 we are all struck when we look at creation. Wow. Look at the mountains of Nepal. Look, look, look at Mount Kilimanjaro. Look at the snow-capped mountains of Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. Oh, look at the stars. Look at the moon. Wow. God says, that one is nothing. He said, the one that should make you go, wow, is the resurrection. Because <laughs> nobody since Genesis had escaped spiritual death and physical death before. Nobody. Very important. So when we say that that to, that, that to the, to the his power, according to his power, according to megatos, the extent is to be compared to resurrection power. So when you have a problem, the question you ask yourself, is there anything that could be stronger than resurrection from the dead? Nothing. All things were subject to Satan up to then. But when Christ came, the, the story changed. So that your car problem is... Is it stronger than rising from the dead? No. So that's not a problem. That house problem, is it stronger than rising from the dead? No, 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 no. What, what again? What again? So there is nothing. There is nothing superior to the power of resurrection. That's what Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him in which area and in the power of his resurrection. He didn't mention any other power. In fact, if you watch the apostles, they never made the, the, some of the statements of David. David, David in the book of Psalms, always linked God's power to moon stars. Psalm number eight. What is man that you are so mindful of him? What is the son of man that you think about him? For you made him a little bit lower than angels and crowned with all glow, glory. Then he says that, look at the heavens. They, they pour forth speech day after day. The sun, the moon, the stars. So the Old Testament folks, because they were physical people, Carnal people, they could only use physical things to see God's power. But when the apostles came, they never made a statement about moon, stars, galaxies. Always, when they were talking about the power of God, Kebadaya, they always referred to the resurrection. See that? So the working of it, we said, was energy, that it is always active, just that you are not using it, of its mighty strength. The mighty strength in the Ephesians 1 is Kratos. It talks about the effect of that power, how it has an impact on physical things to rearrange and reconstitutionize. It's not a small power we have. That's why says you know this. Ah, you know, the days ahead are going to be glorious. <laughs> I prophesy over you in the name of the Lord Jesus that your walk in Christ will take a sweeter turn than before in the light of this knowledge. You are going to enjoy some things, walk in some realms, walk in some understanding, walk in some authority, walk in things, things that you think have delayed. It's the end of those things that you know what to do now. You know what to do now. You know what to do. No more delays, Kebaya, when you know what to do. When I say delays, relative to the time frame of God. Then we said he exerted it in a Jew. Look at all those words, meaning the effect was seen in the resurrection in Christ when God raised him from the dead. So the power that raised him is the Greek word, egiras, meaning the impact to change things, how it roused, how it caused a shifting and alteration him from the dead at its own right. We said, now where are we? Then that power raised Christ to where? Far above. The word is huperanu, beyond any magnitude that has ever been known. All rule, over every kind of rule, archi, the all there is archi, meaning if there was any first realm of influence that existed before this, this one in Christ has surpassed it. So what was the first influence? Satan's influence over Eve and Adam, and consequently to rule through the hearts and mind of men and bring sickness, death, was what was there from Genesis 3 until Jesus showed up. So what we have is superior. Now, isn't it sad that the church has rather focused in teaching about power, more of Satan's power, what he can do, 
and they have belittled what we have in Christ. It should be the other way around. Why should I be? Why should I be teaching on subjects like Satan's ten steps? What is that? What is that? What is that? Paul never taught, taught about Satan's ten steps. Yeah. Inky booms and sicky booms. They, they Paul preach about inky booms and sicky booms. Where? Mami water spirit. Where? Show show me. Show me where Paul talking about mommy water spirit. Show me. Show me. Show me. Show me where. It, it didn't even matter whether it's mommy water or whether it's ink booms and sick booms. What we have is superior. That's what matters. That is what matters. Anything not in the Bible is not true. You will not, you will not even find mommy water in the Ghanaian tree Bible. Not even in the Igbo Bible. Not even the Ibibio Bible. Ah, uh -uh, what are you talking about? It's the creation of men. So the rule we have is superior to anything and the all authority. And that was from the time of Genesis chapter 3. And then we said, he put all things under his feet for the believer. We said that yesterday. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So from the foregoing, so this verse, you see, you should be, you should don't just let, you need to listen to this over and over and over. And even in the world system, they tell us that psychologists, and I don't like to veer in that direction too much. Psychologists tell us that for anybody of knowledge to be anchored in our memory, it needs to be repeated over 60 to 90 times. So how can you listen to this once and think you've gotten it? By three weeks, you forget. So you have to go over it and go over it and go over it until now it becomes first nature. So even if you are asleep and they slap you and you wake up, you know that, oh, I am superior to that. It's not now you don't know what you are doing. You don't know, you are confused, you know. You know. So problem comes, you take it easy, you sit back. When a problem comes, instead of you being all over the place, say, no, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's going on here? You know, somebody, somebody's misbehaving. Let me put things in order. That should be your attitude. Rather than helter skelter all over the place, it means you're not seated in that knowledge, okay? So from the foregoing, in the born again, much less power, which arrives. Now, listen to me carefully for me because now we are going to Ephesians chapter 6. Follow me. In the born again, much less power that we have, which are the rights, killer buyer, the privileges, supernatural energy, wonder working power, boundless might that we have. These are all the power words, which are superior to the word superior. For a lack of any English word, the power we have, the authority, the commanding power we have, is superior than the English word superior. I can't find any word. Is put into active action through words, declarations, and commands in prayer. So please, this one is not that let all my enemies die by fire. There's no Bible verse for that. You are licensing demons when you pray like that. What did God talk about concerning our enemies? Let me show you. Let's go there. Let me show you. Let's go there. Let me show you. I only take one. There are about three Bible verses, but because of time, let me show you one. Let's go there. Let's go to, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Listen to what God said. So how can God who say this? And then after you think that God will answer prayer about killing your enemy. Look at Romans chapter 12. Look at it. Let's go down. Romans 12. Watch. Look at that. Here we are. Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Do what? Do what? Huh? What did he say? Huh? Did he say curse? Did he say insult? Bless those who persecute you. Look at, look at, look at the brackets who are cruel in their attitude toward you. You see what you've been doing at work? That boss that has been persecuting, when they turn over, then you do your hand like this, worker. Yeah, you even say, you, you, you use foul language on them. In your, you insult them in your head and you do this when they turn. <laughs> then when you go to prayer, Father, roast them, kill them, destroy them, roast them, kill. What is that? What is that? Angels will not take that prayer. Mm -mm. God will never answer that prayer. Mm -mm. Never. Bless those. The word bless is benedictum. Speak well. 
Bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy, and with those who are sharing, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and give yourself to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceit. He's talking about human relationship in planet Earth. Verse number 17, Kebo Yababaya. Repay no one evil for evil. So that prayer, because the person did you bad, you said, huh, ah, my God will never disappoint me. What you've done to me, you smell pepper. Father, I pray, I pray, I pray. Let all my enemies die by fire. Die, die, die. Jesus died for that person too. Jesus died for that. He does not want any man to perish. For no, prepare no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. Look at verse 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Verse 19, watch this verse, which has been used wrongly in the wrong Bible interpretation. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath. Wait. You know the way people interpret this verse? Okay, me, I won't do anything to you. My God will show you pepper. Then they say, the Bible says that vengeance is mine. Okay. There is a translation problem in this verse. There's a translation problem. It's not English language. Vengeance is mine. Now, where did Paul get this verse? He took it from Deuteronomy. Why did he take it from Deuteronomy? Because he was speaking to Jews. Why? Because there was a promise in the book of Deuteronomy, starting from Genesis. What is it? God promised in Genesis 3 that I will take care of man's sins and iniquity. So this vengeance is my I will pay. What it means is that when you a believer, you want to you want to now pay somebody back in your coin. Don't forget that. You are human and you were all under Adam's sin. So that man's behavior is, is, the, is because of Adam's sin. And because that person either is not born again, or even if he's born again, he's not, he has not grown up in the things of God, doesn't understand the things of God. So he's influenced by Satan. But when he sees salvation, redemption in Christ, and he's born again, his nature will change, and you see things from a different perspective. So that area of God taking care of their sin in Christ is what he's talking about. You are attacking a person who is not born again. Doesn't know what you know. So they are influenced. He said, that, no, 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 there's a problem here. My job is to make sure that person sees the light. So you attacking them physically, you don't understand salvation. So now look at what, look at God's style of so-called vengeance. So I submit to you that this word vengeance is mine means that my decision, my promise to take care of the sin of Adam is my job. And every human being, because they are under Adam and they don't know, they are influenced to behave negative like that. So you don't have the right because no matter how you beat the person, you slap the person, there is a force of Adam's DNA at the bottom of their behavior. So you should know better. That is what he's talking about. That is what is in the original. How can God tell you that no, that he's not going to do the killing for you? Now, so it is a trans, I submit to you, this word here is a translation problem. Oh, please don't be quoting it to me. You want to fight your enemy. No. Look at God's so-called, so the vengeance is an idiomatic expression. The statement, vengeance is mine. I will repay, require it, says the Lord, is an idiomatic expression. It's not English, vengeance is mine in terms, I will pay you evil for evil. That means God has canceled himself out. 
for him to say this. I didn't want to go that way, but I have to go there. Look at the verse 20, what you mean by vengeance is mine. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Why? Because he's under some influence that your eyes cannot see. You should know better. If he is thirsty, give him drink. Why? Because he's under an influence Then you being a mature believer should know better. He's assuming you know the word and you know the concepts. Huh? For by so doing, you hit burning coals upon your head. Another idiomatic expression. That word burning coals upon his head does not mean that God is bringing punishment on the person's head. It is a proverb. It means by doing so, the person will even become overawed with your kindness and feel ashamed. Do not, verse 21, let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome master evil with good. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew. Pray for those who despitefully use you. He said that do not, do not, do not abuse, revile. See now, so that prayer, going back to our authority, that authority is not for destruction. You remember, why is, why is Paul saying this and why did Jesus say that? Yes, because in the book, in the book of Mark, I think it's John chapter 9, some disciples came to Jesus. And they said, because they were going on their way and they were blocked, Samaria. And then John, Philip, I think so, she came to Jesus and said, Master, ah! These people, they don't know who you are. And that's how we, we do, that's how we Christians do it. We, we, are, we, are, we are operating the power like juju, like shrine. Because when you go to a shrine, if somebody does do evil, my only recourse of action is to do evil to eliminate the person. So we think that's the way God is. So the same disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, he said, shall we call fire from heaven and destroy these people like Elijah did? Where did, where did the disciples get that example? Is it not in the Bible? Yes. So the fact that something is in the Bible does not mean we have to emulate it hook, line, and sinker. You have to understand the context. So Jesus corrected their thinking. He said, hey, for you do not. He said, the Bible says he rebuked them. That word rebuked is the same word that is used to talk about to cast out devils. That means the influence of the disciples was of the evil one to say that they are going to copy Elijah to call fire from heaven. It is evil thing. The power was given, but the power was not given to destroy. Another human. Look at what Jesus said. He said, you do not know of what manner of spirit you are. For the son of man, Kebo Katabatoto, did not come to destroy human lives. Huh? 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 But to save them. And they went to another village. That means God can still go to where he wants to go without destroying or making collateral damage. He does not need to destroy. He, he can still achieve his objective without destroying anybody. So he said that, what? Be or emulate your father. Be imitators of Christ. Of me, Paul, and as I imitate Christ. So when we talk about those with the authority we have, in commanding prayer, we are dealing with the what? The activities behind the scenes, not the person. Are we clear on that? Okay, with that at the back of our mind, we said that, remember, we are dealing with having an accurate understanding of the believer's authority. Accurate is the word. And being conscious of it. Remember, it is not God who is keeping things from us, nor angels, but Satan through the mind of men systems of those who do not believe the gospel. So, now we are coming to, I'll have to touch Ephesians, it's too big. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 21 or 20 is too big to do it even in one hour. So, I'm going to break it up and we shall deal with it exegetically all the way till Friday and learn. So, now, if you understand what I've taught all these two weeks of Ephesians chapter one, knowing where we are, 
knowing our authority, knowing our position as a lifestyle, then as a believer, when we come to Ephesians chapter six, so if you are a teacher here, if you are a believer here, if you lead Sunday school here, never teach Ephesians chapter six in isolation from Ephesians chapter one. Once you do that, your teaching will be wrong completely. That's how we've been doing it. So our job is to enforce and stop his noticed and suspecting activities. Our job. That is why Paul solidly established in Ephesians chapter one, the overwhelming superiority of our position and authority in Christ in chapter one of Ephesians. Before we even get to chapter six, Consequently, to teach Ephesians chapter 6 alone in isolation from Ephesians chapter 1 will lead to wrong explanation and error. And everywhere I went in Christendom, wherever I went, when they are going to lead prayer meeting, they jump first to Ephesians 6 10. Or they start from 12. For we wrestle not. How can you start a sentence by 4? 4 is Old English word, therefore. I told you that anytime you see therefore, it presupposes that it is predicated or it's based on an argument that was going on before. Therefore, before. See that now? So that means, therefore, we wrestle not. It's based on Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 11 upwards to verse 1, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 1, the nucleus of Paul's argument about the believer's position. The moment you start quoting Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, on its own, I guarantee you, you will make it mean so many things that the Bible is not talking about. Look at the way we use it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, wicked spirits in the high places. My brother, my sister, these ones, they are very wicked in the high places. You know, they are very strong. Hey, you know, all, then, 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 now, now all of a sudden, some even spend one hour teaching on the hierarchy of Satan. Did Paul do that? Then they start bringing things that are not even in the Bible. Siki booms and inky booms. Mami water spirit. Uh, the army is a mess. At the end of that meeting, the believer is confused, full of fear, unsettled, razzled, razzmatazz. And he thinks, now he goes to bed thinking that even every little noise is Satan. He hears somewhere, click, 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 click. When he's even sitting in the car, all his mind is accident, accident, because this thing they can burst my car tie, accident. You are in bondage. Oh, oh, oh bondage stand fast Ephesians 5 1 in the liberty where Christ has set you free and be you not entangled again with the yoke of bondage why why you are thinking of demon 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 my people in my village oh my village people oh 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 tempestors so to teach Ephesians chapter 6 away from chapter 1 bridge these kind of problems. The whole book of Ephesians is summed up in three areas or two areas. One, where we sit in Christ by virtue of our born again spirits eternally. Two, based on our sitting position, how we should walk or put it into practice. One aspect of that walk or understanding is that the believer is a spiritual enforcer. Now that is the way we are going to work with today. Before I close, you are an enforcer. He's not saying fight them. That is what Ephesians chapter 6 from verses 10 to 21 is about. The believer is an enforcer. So wait, before you start thinking some, what, who is an enforcer? Look at it. According to the Webster's Dictionary. So that word wrestle is not means fight. We'll come to that. Who is an enforcer? A person, follow me here. Uh, who is an enforcer? A person or group of persons that compels observance of 
or compliance with a law, compliance with a rule or an obligation. They observe and compel that you comply. They observe, huh? observe, you see it in that verse, observe. Then you do what? You compel or enforce that they comply. Huh? Huh? Okay, so for example, for example, let's take this example. Let's take this example. Keba Kotobaya, are you catching the flow? Are you catching the revelation here? This is the idea that Paul had. Not the other way around that, you know, we have to fight him on fight. No, 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 no. Look at, for example, the city police's role as enforcers of traffic rules is to make sure no motorist is out of line relative to traffic rules. So I want to ask you a question here. Are the police going about their duty, fighting people to enforce the law? Is that what the police officer who is at the junction, eh? and who is at the Kaneshi junction, who is at the London junction, who is at the Lagos junction? Is he there with the motto? And every motorist that pass, fight them, slap them, uh -huh. slap, head this one. Eh? We are, we are fine, eh? No, he's, he's parked, he's parked his vehicle quietly. You know, the camera is on, his radio is here. He's chilled out. He's watching everything. He's watching everything. He's watching everything. The moment somebody goes out of line, he puts on the light. Wee, 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 wee. He goes up there and please park. He doesn't even slap him the first time. Sir, can you please park? Um, can I please have your license? Yeah. Well, okay. Um, you know, I'm an officer of the law. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you know that I saw you doing a 40 MPH and a 30 MP? Oh, oh. All right. Well, um, your name? Date of birth, yeah? I give you a citation, a ticket. Thank you. You appear in court in seven days. Now, when he gives you that, he serves you that notice. He has put you back in order. Huh? Did he slap you? No. Did he hurt you? No. Huh? So not at all. They are not fighting people. No. What are they doing? They are mostly in observance mode. And if they notice anything improper, Huh? They enforce what is proper. That is the idea Ephesians chapter is talking about. So I am here. I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. My job naturally is to go to work and work and get my salary. Ah, but now after, you know, after about seven, eight months, I see that my boss is behaving one kind, one kind. Ah, ah. Oh, what is this? He used to smile with me, go to drink coffee together. You know, after about... What you didn't know is that when you left, somebody came and did a gossip. You didn't see that. Huh? The Bible says that gossip, the words of a tale bearer, they are like choice morsels and go to the innerward parts of a being. That means the man respected you until somebody presented another view of you. Do you see, John? When you are not here, he switches on all the computers and jumps on the table and dances. Oh, Ah, so this is what John has been doing. So the respect that I had for John out of the middle. Now, I changed my position towards John. How did that happen? An unseen influence. So now I got to go to work. Ah, this is not normal. So maybe I'm approaching physically. Oh, Mr. 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 Barnett, yeah. Um, have I done anything wrong with you? He doesn't want to, you know, sort of rush. say, oh, no, it's all right. But you can see he's cold. He's not responding to me. We no more longer go for cappuccinos. Ah. It is out of line, oh, because somebody spoke words. So now I have to cancel. It. So now when I go to prayer, I command any wrong suggestions. That have been spoken to my boss. That is causing him to be like, I paralyze it. I expose it and I put an end to it. Now all of a sudden, after three weeks, you were in the photocopying room. And here came Mr. Barnett. Oh, hi, John. Oh, hi. Mr. Barnett. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hey, you know what? When we finish tonight, right, let's go for our normal cappuccino. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you. What changed? Ah, control room. <laughs> control room. You took care of it. You enforced it. You put things right. That is what we are doing. That is, we are enforcers. He didn't say fight them. Huh? Do everything normal you're supposed to do. The moment you notice something is out of line, put it back in order. 
That's what he's talking about. See? So the believer, therefore, and I will not touch Ephesians chapter 6. Let me end it here. And I will now, will now read this at the back of my We'll deal with it tomorrow. So the believer, therefore, is a spiritual police enforcer. That is why you must know the Bible, though, to make sure Satan's, it should be a Satan's activity, not Satan's act. Satan's eh, 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 typo. Satan's activities are not out of line in the light of the word of God. So you know his word says, for God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So when fear is beginning to enter, it is out of line of this rule spiritually. Put it back. He has also said in 1 John, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith. So if something trying to overcome you, enforce it. Put it back in order. Then he said in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Take note of the sentence, Kulubra Hazikayah. He did not say that the weapon will not be formed. He said, no weapon formed. So don't form it. The only thing that is restrictive in that clause is that it will not prosper. The word prosper means go full term, like nine months in the baby in the womb of a mother. They will start it, they will do it, but it will not go full term. No weapon form, you will form it against you. It will be against you. Will not prosper. Huh? Then in the same way, he says that, huh? and then he said, any tongue that rises up against you. What is the word tongue? Tongue is another word. It means that any language, vocabulary, in thought or speech. What is vocabulary? You will not make it. It's a vocabulary. Are you sitting down? Everybody in your family is not getting married. You too, you're not getting married. Vocabulary. You are sitting there. You are sitting now. And you see that they say that life has become very hard. Oh, you are sitting now. See that now. Those are vocabulary. They are out of line because of that verse. Any tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn. Mm -hmm. For this is the heritage of the children of God. That is your heritage. You condemn it. So he says, nobody shall make it. You say, it is a lie, for it is written. They say that the life is happy. It's a lie. My God shall supply all my needs. Have you seen what is going on here? We are enforcing in the light of the way. That is our job. Because we sit above them. We have high. We have all this power. We are high above them. And sometimes they want to misbehave. Just like the police officer standing there and there's a crowd passing at the carnival. Some people, when they see police officers, then their demons are irritated. They want to misbehave. Then they go and they go do the police. Hey, hey. The police doesn't mind him. You are not out of line. That's okay. You can do what you want. But the moment the police sees him going through somebody's pocket and trying to pick something, the police will now jump to action. See that now? Yeah. We are the spiritual police and forces. So that is why if you read the Ephesians chapter 6, that we will read tomorrow, uh, he talks about what? Watching there to in perseverance. Watching, observing. Are you observant? Watching. Ah, I've noticed that even though I've learned the subject, but when I get to the exam room, my mind is all over the, no, no, that's unusual, that's unusual. Enforce and put it, it's out of line. It's out of line. So you must observe. We shall continue with this tomorrow when now we are going to deal with Ephesians chapter 6 and deal with it correctly. I will not let the English language mislead us because the English language translation limits the meaning. We shall deal with all the key operative words. So you see that Paul was not saying that you must go in and be fighting these people in prayer. I shoot you, Po. I head you, Papa. I fight you. Fire, 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 fire. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul is talking about at all. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Kidena. Hallelujah.